Christ is born. Christos of Stacia. Christ is born. Glad you're here today on this beautiful nativity Christmas morning. The joy it is to celebrate. We're here in uh, lovely climes of northern northwestern PA where we have actually a green Christmas this year. Yeah, right? Very unusual for us this year. Uh, but God is good, and thank God for that. So a couple weeks ago, uh, we talked about the book of Hebrews and how powerful a book that was. And how it tells of who Jesus is and what his purpose is and what his meaning is, right? Um, we know from hearing of the uh, epistle today that Jesus was considered the, the fullness of all time. You know, that's why our calendars are the way they are, right? Um, when Jesus was born, relatively speaking, it started back at zero again. So there was something significant about Christ that went all the way back even to the calculation of time and how that works. And the Father knew this. He knew that when he sent his son, it was going to change everything, right? Now, why did he send his son? That's the big question, right? Why? Why send this little baby? And so I thought I would consult Hebrews again uh, and just read to you the opening uh, verses of Hebrews. God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers through the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things. Through him also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of the glory of his glory and the express image of his person, speaking of the Father, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become so much better than the angels, as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. Here we see that the Lord actually has even inherited our nature now. That our nature he has taken on so specially by being a little baby, even starting out in that realm, right? Our world of, you know, we all, we all the altar boys and I yesterday were talking about how we were all little babies at one time. Do you remember? And, you know, we're kind of like, no, we don't remember. <laughs> you know, none of us remember our baby life. But the Lord, he wanted to come down and even experience this, this vulnerability, right? The bringing ourselves, well, you can't ask for a more humble way than to be a baby, right? If you think about it, you know, we're one of the only uh, mammalian species, at least in the world. That's why we're so unique and special. But, um, you know, all the other mammals in the world, you know, usually they take off pretty quickly after they're, they're born. And they don't have to have a lot of help. But with us, we need help for a long time, you know? We could run out into traffic or, you know, who knows what we can do. We can get into big trouble, right? We all know this. As soon as you have a two-year-old, you understand this very quickly. But as little children, we're so vulnerable. And we really, even though we're adults, most of us are adults here, and when we grow up, we're still really fragile, you know? We're still really vulnerable and fragile, and we can easily break, you know? We can easily be destroyed. And so it's still such a mystery, isn't it? And such a wonder that God chose to be like us in this vulnerable state. But as you can see from Hebrews, right? He came down because he wanted to transform it. He was the creator of the world. So I believe that his original intention for you and I as human beings was not to be fragile, right? Was not to be so uh, easily broken, but that we would have more strength. And I think what the Lord has come to do is to come down to us, go through everything we went through. And by the way, in Hebrews, there's two places in Hebrews where the Hebrew writer says, the Lord came down to be tempted just like us, to experience the things of the world just like we do, but to show how you can resist it and how you can say, the no word. <laughs> and how you can, you can turn things off and you can walk away from things that are unclean and unholy. 
It's within our capabilities because the Lord has proved it for us. This really, brothers and sisters, is what he has come to do. Because he wants to take us with him. He wants us to be with him in all eternity. And that's the other feature of Hebrews. The Lord is the Lord of forever. Which means we don't believe like the world does. The world believes that the world is short, that you've got to live this life every moment and get everything out of it you possibly can because you might miss something. And oh boy, if you would miss some pleasure that you, know, you thought you never could have, I mean, wouldn't that be terrible if you died without that? This is the world's mentality because they have no hope. But the one thing that we do have, that faith brings us, right? We define faith is the substance of things hoped for. And we hope. Our hope, though, is not in something that is intangible or unreal. Our hope is in the living, incarnate Jesus Christ, who came down as the baby. But he grew to be a man. And then he even went through the other part of the thing that we have to go through. The birth thing is the first one. We all have to do that. And then the second thing that we all have to do in between living is to die. Because this is, unfortunately, what our punishment was at the beginning. Humanity had all to die because of their unwillingness to obey. So we're all required to go through that. And Jesus, when he became a man, he also was required to go through that. And he did. We know the story. He was crucified on a cross in the Roman Empire, buried in a rich man's tomb. But on the third day, through prophecy, he arose from the dead. And through the power of the Holy Spirit, and that he was literally God himself. And he was buried in a tomb. In our icon of the nativity, we see that Christ was born in a cave. Well, a cave and a tomb in Israel were very similar. Many times they used caves for burial places. And so we see here an image that Jesus is even telling us at his birth, as he lays above the virgin, right? <laughs> Pictured above her, right? Not in her arms, but as though he is over her. And we hear in the early traditions of Jesus' early life that he literally worked miracles even in his infancy. Just like some of these little babies that we have in our midst today also work miracles in us. Little babies have a way in their humility of changing us, and the Lord was no different. So that image of the tomb is flashed before us even at the nativity to remind us once again, why is Jesus here? Why did he come? He came to take us with him. He wants you. He loves you. He came for all of humanity. He came for every one of us. No one did he not come for. But it's up to us, like Mary, to choose. For us to say yes. For us to invite him to be part of our life. And then live like he really is part of us. Because one of the things that the Lord teaches us and asks of us is that we obey his commandments. So when he grew up and he taught us, he taught us the way to live. And that's to be obedient to his commandments, primarily to love God and to love our neighbor, to care for those around us. This is a season when we do that, right? We give gifts to one another. We share with one another our love for them. Sometimes it's the ugly sweater, or it's the strange looking tie, or, you know, but it's still love, right? <laughs> it's that love that's being sent out. Brothers and sisters, this is what the season is about. It's about the incarnate Jesus Christ and his love for mankind. He's the ultimate gift. And now we ask you to be that gift also. Be that gift. Be the gift of love for other people. And you'll fulfill the Christmas wish, really, of God. I think his Christmas wish is that we would be like him. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Christ is born. Christ is born. Christ is born.